Hey everyone, Genome here. Coming at you with the next interview in my series where I take a look at people who do interesting things. Uh, my guest tonight is actually a uh, time traveler. He's uh, speaking to us from the future. It's actually tomorrow uh, for us, or he is at right now. So I am talking with someone who I've been conversing with somewhat through the digital realm since about oh, 2001 or two or so. So we're talking about none other than uh, MMA, Australian MMA pioneer Elvis Sinisek. Elvis, how are you doing this evening? Yeah, I'm good, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me on today. Oh, it's great to have you. This has been a long time coming. We've been kind of going back and forth to, to get schedules. As as one can imagine, you're a busy man, and then you have a time differential, so it's always something, isn't it? Yeah, it always makes it interesting. Uh, I, mean, I guess that's one of the uh, beauties of the Internet, shall we say, that uh, you know it does allow us to connect with people all across the world. I mean, it has its uh, ups and downs, so... Yeah, I mean, there's always the uh, social media isolation that people get into, but there's also the fact that you can reach out socially to people you could never, ever talk to in the past. So it's just, uh, I love the media myself, but that's just me. Um, oh, no, look, I, um, mm -hmm. I'm an IT person, uh, so I grew up with computers. Like, I, was, I started with mailing lists before even there was anything, then chat rooms, and then that slowly built up to forums, and then forums to online. Now we have Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Um, millions of ways to connect with people so yeah no no i'm definitely a fan i think it um it has been a net positive uh, overall as you said if people over emerge themselves into it and don't have anything outside of it then there can be a problem but if you use it in conjunction with everything else you're doing having a active normal social life um it's a actually fantastic way to, to connect with people that have similar interests all across the world or people who have dissimilar interests, and you want to argue the point. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You know, I was in telecom, too, and, and uh, token ring uh, Ethernet was still a thing when I was back in, <laughs> in the technology sector. So, <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's amazing to see the progression of things. So, uh, so, Elvis, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, um, as, as you heard, my name is Elvis. Uh, I was an MMA fighter. Uh, I was the first Australian to fight in the UFC. Um, I actually fought in the first ever Australian MMA event, uh, which at the time was called the Australasian UFC. Um, but due to legal uh, wranglings, it got renamed to Cage Combat 1. Um, that's where I actually picked up my fight uh, name, uh, the King of Rock and Rumble. And with a name like Elvis, um, it wasn't really any surprise that it was going to happen. Uh, it pretty much stuck with me from there on. Um, I competed in the first Australian MMA, uh, MMA title, so I won the first Australian heavyweight uh, MMA title uh, back in 98. I ended up traveling to Japan, fighting in rings. I fought in the first ever ADCC event. Um, I was the f This is a great one. I was the first person to ever land a heel hook sub submission in ADCC competition, so that's a... Uh, Pretty cool uh, kind of uh, achievement there. Um, ended up fighting in rings. Uh, I was one of the first people to go for a go-go um, plata submission. I didn't get it due to rope escapes. Continued training. Ended up uh, fighting uh, in the UCC for their heavyweight world title. Didn't get that. Ended up moving from there to fight uh, Ken, uh, Frank Shamrock in K1, and then eventually they got me into the UFC, um, had a long career in the UFC, ended up traveling around the world, fighting in Japan, Sweden, London, um, just more places, Canada, that I, that I, you know, that I can list. Um, and then once I retired, I got into some commentary, um, started working for Fox Sports with the UFC um, here in Australia, UFC Fight Week, the show was called. Um, and the whole time while I was also fighting, I was running my own martial arts school, which today is branded as King's Academy. Well, look at that storied career already. We're just getting started. So, yeah, you've done a ton of stuff. I've been following you since, oh, gosh, like I said, uh, the early UFC days, or I guess that was the early middle UFC days. But, uh, so, yeah, it's been quite the uh, story career, and it's amazing how the fight game lets you just travel all over the world, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's just incredible between that and chess. Oh, no, look, <laughs> yeah, had, had it not been for the UFC, I don't think I would have seen um, half the world that, that I have. I've, I've been to, you know, most major continents. Um, so, yeah, you know, got to experience different cultures. And I have to say, you know, the UFC was good with that because there was a couple of times where 
I would fly out to a UFC like I to the first event in London and then afterwards I was going to Brazil um, to compete at world championships for jiu-jitsu and they're like yeah well we'll give you a around the world ticket so I you know, saved me a little bit of money oh, I, admittedly the the purses weren't anything to kind of um, cheer about but hey I wasn't doing it for the money at the time anyway Oh, and just for uh, the audience to know, um, he mentioned earlier a heel hook. That's a lower leg lock. Uh, I'll try to put some footage of that um, a little bit later on um, just to show you some clips. And I'll try to get some of the go-go plot. That was versus Tamura, wasn't it, when you did the go-go yes, plot attempt? Yeah, Yoshi Tamura in the rings. And um, that, that was um, a fun fight. It was, it was a bit – it was the first time I'd fought um, in a, that, those sort of modified rules. And I didn't know what to expect. I, I'd heard it was fake and – and, you know, obviously it wasn't. Mm -hmm. I mean, they have their worked fights, but they also have their real fights. And then you have the, the shin pads and then the rope escapes, which um, were confusing. And then, but saying that, it also, um, I picked up an injury during that bout in a leg lock exchange with um, Tamura. And I switched my stance during the fight. And Frank Shamrock ended up watching some of the footage. And based on my switch stance, he thought I was a southpaw, not orthodox. So when we ended up fighting, I caught him off by surprise, <laughs> unintentionally. Oh no! Well, that was that was deep fight planning, though. Don't be so modest, my friend. Uh, <laughs> so let's uh, let's get back a little bit into your uh, earlier years. So, um, what age did you start training martial arts? Oh, I started about uh, eight years old. Um, like it was more of a, my parents just wanted to put me into a sport that was in the evening so they could have a bit of a time to themselves and uh, myself, my brother, my sister, we all it got put into uh, judo classes. So I did judo um, during my primary school years. Um, then eventually when I moved to, to high school, the high school didn't have a judo class. So I started looking for something different. Being a big fan of Bruce Lee, I wanted um, more of a striking style and um, again, not being very well versed, I saw a sign for or an ad for Taekwondo school, which and I, you know, stopped people telling telling me it was the Korean Kung Fu, and I'm like, oh, Kung Fu, <laughs> Bruce Lee, it, it must be the same thing. So I ended up doing Taekwondo, and then um, did that through my high school years, and then uh, went to university. Pretty much stopped doing it then. Um, just because of the, the, the study schedule, I end up taking up some other sports, end up becoming a pro beach volleyball player, which is totally random there. Um, and then after I uh, finished university, end up working full time, caught up with one of my uh, friends from high school who um, knew I did Taekwondo. He did Kyosh, Kyokushin. And he goes, why aren't you training anymore? You're always really good. And I went, yeah, I don't know. And then so he actually brought me a tape of UFC too. And I'm like, dear God, this stuff is awesome. I want to do this. So I started looking for a school that did that UFC training. Of course, there wasn't any. I uh, found a Jun Fan school that did grappling and striking combined. I did that, ended up moving to Sydney, looking for a Brazilian jiu-jitsu school because while I was doing the Jun Fan, started reading magazines, discovered John Will um, and his journey with the, the, the Gracies and then the Machados. And I actually then ended up joining a John Will Academy under uh, my first jiu-jitsu coach, uh, Anthony Lange. Yeah, it was funny you mentioned uh, Taekwondo. Um, sometimes it gets kind of a bad rap. A lot, some of the martial arts get kind of a bad rap. You know, it's like, that's not practical. It's not real world. I took a keto for a few years, and uh, while I don't think a lot of it was very practical, my gosh, I guess it depends on your instructor because he worked us like dogs, man. He didn't have air conditioning. It, at best, he would turn the fan on, and he just worked us for two straight hours. It'd be rolling and, and throws, and it was, it was something else. So if nothing else, it, it gave me a good uh, physical foundation for moving into submission wrestling, which I went into a little bit later. But. Yeah, no, look, the, the, the style I did as well was very hardcore. Like, we did full, con full contact sparring. There were no pads. We didn't have not even gloves let alone foot pads or shin pads. I mean, we were um, hardcore school, we were punching each other in the face with bare knuckles. Um, and I kind of look back and go, maybe not the best idea, but hey, it toughened me up. And um, when I first stepped into um, the cage, I wasn't afraid of bare fist fighting. So I guess it, it did help in the long run. So uh, what age did you have your first uh, professional fight? I was, that would have been 19, 
97, which was uh, the first Australasian UFC, so 97 would put me at uh, 26 years of age. Okay, so yeah, you definitely were there at the outset. That um, so when you were coming up, did you have a like a fighting role model? Did you have somebody that was basically your mentor through most of it, or was it more varied uh, along the way? Um, look, it, it was kind of a very um, tumultuous era. Um, as I said, I first discovered Bruce Lee, and he was someone that I really looked up to, and uh, I wanted to be like Bruce. And then I discovered UFC. So, of course, I saw Hoist Gracie, and I'm like, well, you know, I want to be like Hoist. Um, through that, I found John Will, and I, I, he was, again, he was a pioneer back in the day. Um, he was actually teaching Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. He was the first person to, to bring it over and actually start spreading it here in Australia. Um, but his style was called shoot fighting because back then he was like, you can't, rely on you know he discovered the graces and he's like well you've got to know striking you've got to know grappling and so he was integrating striking and grappling he called it shoot fighting um and then some of his students actually broke off um and one of them ended up setting up a gracie baja uh, academy and um and became more of a purist jiu-jitsu and goes oh this shoot fighting stuff is rubbish uh, john ended up going uh, full BJJ in the in the long run. Just as he got older, it just became more applicable. But he was doing that all that cross training. That so when I you know first stepped into MMA, even though um, everyone was still looking at it as style versus style, I was already looking at it at being having to be v uh, versed in striking, takedowns, and grappling. So. Um, even though it was still in the early days, um, I was quite lucky uh, with that. So, you know, John was a, a great role model. And then obviously once I discovered the UFC, uh, you know, looking up to fighters like um, <coughs> Anderson Silva and then um, discovering Pride and Antonio Nogueira. And again, it just continued to, uh, to grow through there. Yeah, I mean, speaking of shoot, I remember, um, let's see this thing that... It's, uh, I remember reading, I think, a story, I believe it was with Hulk Hogan, the American wrestler here, and uh, Hulk was going to Japan to wrestle over there, but he was working with a shoot fighter over there. He was still pretty green, and uh, Hulk Hogan back then was about 340 pounds. He's an enormous guy, right? And so I guess they were giving him a hard time by taking something from this little shoot guy, you know? So I guess he started lifting off a little bit, and the shoot guy rode, <laughs> jumped in and just broke his leg. <laughs> it was, it's, he tells that story all the time. It's just hilarious, man. So, yeah, it gets pretty serious over there. Um, oh yeah, well that's um, yeah. That they've always had that shoot style of uh, pro wrestling. It's a, even when it's fake, it's not fake. So I mean, yeah, the injuries are real, so don't let, don't let it fool you. Um, so you fought for several different organizations around the world, fight organizations. Um, was there any particular organization that you think best fit you and your skill set? Um, I mean, obviously. Uh, I had a great deal of respect for the UFC. I really felt they were one of the market leaders. I, I really enjoyed um, the professionalism that they had behind the event. Um, fighting in K1 was, was exciting because they had, a very, had the pride rule set, which I, I thought was really cool. But I never actually got the, uh, the opportunity to fight in pride. I think that was one of the um, things I'm most disappointed about. I, I really would have liked to have had that... Uh, that uh, organization on my list because I thought I thought their style of fighting was uh, suited me very well. I was more of about trying to fight for the finish and I, I didn't really care about points. It's the same way I do my jiu-jitsu. I don't play. I never really used to play for points or try and win, you know, win the match that way. For me, it was all about trying to get the finish. And um, even though UFC rewarded that, there was a lot of other people because of the rounds. It was, um, you still had to keep in mind that it was a, um, scoring anytime there was a scoring opportunity to get into a control position, um, people were using that rather than looking for the finish. Um, yeah, you know, and I fought in uh, you know the UCC, which became TKO, where GSP came from. I fought in uh, Pancras K1, uh, the UFC, obviously. Um, honestly, I just enjoyed it all. Like um, for me, it was just about the challenge and and pushing myself to the limit. Uh, under the rule set that was given to me. I, I always found a way to adapt. And I guess 
that, that comes from the uh, Bruce Lee menta- mentality, takes what's useful and dispose what's not. Yeah, even during my very, very limited submission wrestling run that I had, <clears throat> I, I lost a lot of matches that I probably could have just drug out because I always took chances because there's nothing worse than I hate than watching a guy pull guard for about 10 straight minutes and then the whistle blows. I just used to irk me so I would just I would give up a bad position just to go for something you know and it, it usually cost me but <laughs> just the kind of guy I was but yeah I, I feel your pain on that one yeah well I, I had to walk around in the boot one time because of that too but that's a story for another day um yeah I, I, I love the pride rule set too I love their uh their tournament format which is amazing uh but uh yeah that's uh yeah it's, too, it's a shame couldn't get over there uh it, it was really a, it was a really wide open thing back then and it's too bad they didn't last too because uh I just love their promotion, but it's probably enough about pride for now. So, um, so you had a run-in with possibly the most famous uh, MMA guy at the time, Mr. Frank Shamrock, in the ring, um, and you went the distance with him. Do you think that was a turning point in your MMA career? Oh, look, absolutely. Um, I'd um, touched base with the UFC prior to that. I think it was uh, John Peretti who was then... <coughs> Apologies, uh, John Peretti, who was uh, matchmaking, and I said, "Look, hey, you know, I've, I've had some fights. I want to get into the UFC." Um, and then he, you know, looked into it, and he goes, "Look, the, 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 at this point, you know, with our budget, the cost of the flight far exceeds what we can afford to do. If you ever get over to the US, um, we're willing to discuss it then." Um, but didn't really give me, you know, if I flew over there, there was no guarantees. I didn't really want to just jump on a plane because, again. You know, the, the cost of the flights were pro- quite prohibitive back in the day. Um, and then I got the opportunity um, to fight in the UFC. UCC. I'd already been talking with them. So, um, again, this goes back to the, the IT area. I was on a mailing list called the Combat List. And on that Combat List, I got in touch with the, this guy who was, his screen name was Wino because he used to make his own wine. Um, but he was also um, working with the, the UCC. Um, another uh, little uh, or not so well named uh, person was also on that mailing list who I was uh, chatting to as well, and he ended up working uh, for the UFC. So um, at the time, I got the contact uh, with the UCC, and they were looking um, at a tournament. I want to go to light heavyweight, but they're like, look, light heavyweight's um, – too deep we've got too many people we, we, we're looking for heavyweights and uh, they're like in our we're going to have a heavyweight title on our first event and on the second show we're going to have a heavyweight tournament would you be interested in jumping into the heavyweight tournament i'm like eh, whatever uh, i won my heavyweight title in australia and you know it was, it was still in the day where there was more about the challenge than uh the division so i said yeah look absolutely i'll jump into your your heavyweight tournament uh on your second show and then in the lead up to their first show, um, uh, one of their fighters um, got into a car accident, broke his neck, um, and had to pull out of the show. And so they've called me on like um, 10 days, two weeks' notice, you know, very short kind of time. He said, Look, we've lost our um, title fight. Would you be interested in jumping in and fighting Kimo for the heavyweight belt? And I was like, Awesome. I'll do that. Oh, I guess it was like it was a great opportunity. I get to go overseas. I get to fight in MMA, and I get to fight for a title belt. So I kind of jumped into into that. Um, Keep in mind, people, uh, Kimo was probably running fight. around 250 pounds back then, just uh, maybe 225 between 230, maybe at weigh in. But I'm sure he came in I around think 250. Was, I think it was about 230, 230 235. He? Yeah. So um, on the flight over, apparently, Kimo broke his finger. Um, and the promoters were telling me they did. They found out because he was supposed to be on a flight. He didn't get on the flight. They tried contacting him. He never got in touch with them. And then on the ADC uh, AD Combat uh, website, which was back then the number one news site for um, submission wrestling and MMA uh, in the world, there was a photo of him with his finger in a cast um, and an X-ray, holding up an X-ray and. Um, so they're like, oh, well, we could have just jumped on the plane and told us we would have been fine with it because they said at least that way we could have shown the crowd and let everyone know. Um, but he ended up, you know, they contacted him and they said, look, please come to the show, tell everyone about the accident. 
and we'll book you for the title defense. Um, and he's like, yeah, yeah, but he actually never jumped on the plane. I landed, I get there, I find out I have no opponent. And they've gone, oh, would you like to fight Jeremy Horn? And I'm like, yeah, I'll take the fight. Because I knew Jeremy was uh, around my weight. He'd already um, fought Frank. Um, and I'm like, yeah, that's, you know, a great opportunity. He's a big name, fought in the UFC. Um, but then their team, Mil- team Militich, turned it down. Or Jeremy, I'm not sure someone turned it down. He ended up not deciding not to come out. And then they're like, oh, we've got some replacements. And they're like, we've got a, would you be interested in fighting Tom Erickson? And I said, look, I was actually. <laughs> He's like 280 like pounds, isn't he? <laughs> oh, yeah, he was over 300 pounds. He's huge, like the big cat. And I'm like, look, I was scheduled to fight him, and I would be happy to fight him with a decent preparation. He is that big um, that I really need to prepare properly. Like, I, I'm so, I was soaking wet 215 pounds with all, you know, all my clothes on. Um, I didn't want to jump in on, on, like, literally two days' notice to fight, you know, Tom Erickson. I had a lot of respect for him. And they're like, oh, okay, how about Dan Severn? I'm like, well, Dan Severn's not much smaller. He was about 280, 290 at the time. I'm like, look, I don't want to mess up your show. If you really want, put those two together. They're two giant heavyweights. They'll be fantastic champions. And yeah, they're um, both wrestlers. I mean, you know, yeah. that fight, I'm sure everyone would love to see it. And they're like, no, 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 we'll see what else we can uh, do. And they ended up <coughs> going, oh, we've got Dave Benito. Dave Benito fought in the UFC. He fought Carlos Bajeto. Um, would you be interested in fighting him? I'm like, yeah, okay. I'm like, but I thought he was 265. And they're like, no, 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 no. We've spoken to him. He's only about 230. And I go, well, okay, that's fair enough. That's the um, the same size as chemo. So we get to the weigh-ins. Boom, I jump on. I actually um, had tracksuit pants and I put ankle weights on underneath um, because I was actually walking around at that point at about 205 pounds. I didn't want to walk in uh, under under weight. So I, I put the ankle weights on, tracksuit. I had my jacket on. I had some weights in my pockets. And I think I ended up weighing in at about 215 pounds. Like, yeah. Um, and then hey, Benito jumps on. He weighs in at 263 pounds. <laughs> and I turn around. Like, uh, I've gone to the promoters and I'm like, you said he was 230. How does he go from 230 to two, almost 265? And they're like, he told us he was 245. I'm like, you still told me the wrong number. They go like, so he's obviously brought his weight down to sound reasonable. They've undercut him. And I'm like, oh, yeah, 230, 235, that, that's good. And it's like 265. And I'm like, yeah, I'm here anyway. I may as well do it. Ended up going to um, <coughs> a 20, uh, two 10-minute rounds, 20-minute decision. Um, I kind of felt I got screwed over because it ended up being a draw. Um, and that's why I think the footage never got released because while I was going – I'd been kicking his leg chronically during the fight. And then he, he's taken me down and I've jumped into a submission attempt. I had his arm extended. Um, I was literally just starting to crank it and he yelled, stop, stop, stop. <laughs> I thought it was because of the arm, but because it was on tight. So I've held it. I've gone, ref, he's uh, tapping, he's tapping. The ref stopped, what's the matter? And um, Dave's going, oh, my knee, my knee, my knee. So they stopped the fight because his knee dislocated off the shot because I he shot I kicked his knee and then he finished the shot and so his knee dislocated and I'm like well that's still a submission he's given up you know you can't stop the fight and then um recontinue I was wrong so because he was um the you know the local Canadian um or maybe just because they didn't want the show to end that way they let the match continue uh ended up going to decision um and even though he did no damage on the ground because he got all the takedowns, a couple of the judges gave him the fight. Or sorry, one of the judges gave him the fight. One of the judges gave me the fight. And the, uh, another judge called it a draw. So it ended up being a unanimous draw. So it would have been my first um, world title. and um, Or actually, it would have been my only looking back now. But <laughs> at, back then, it would, it would have been, to me, it was like I had just been taking away my first uh, world title. So that was a little bit disappointing. But that gave me the springboard um, to, to go into the UFC because that other little-known person on the combat list was this guy called Joe Silva who was working um, uh, alongside Peretti inside the UFC. So once um, Zufa took over, 
Peretti kind of disappeared off the scene. I'm sure the old school people would have been familiar with him because he was part of, um, I think it was Extreme Fighting as well. He did the commentary on that. And um, so he disappeared off the scene. Joe Silva took over and, um, again, last minute opportunity. Jeremy Horn was supposed to be fighting Cafe Dante uh, for the number one contender spot to face Tito for the world title. Um, two weeks before the show, Cafe Dante's gotten um, staff and he's had this massive hole in his leg and it's like, well, he's not going to be able to compete. Um, Joe's contacted everyone. Nobody back then wanted to fight Tito on short notice. I got this call like at 4 a.m. in the morning. It's like, hey, this is Joe. I'm like, Joe? I don't know a Joe. Oh, Joe from the UFC. Oh, oh Joe, combat list. Yeah, yeah. He's like, uh, would you be interested in fighting um, Jeremy for the number one contender spot? <laughs> sure, sure. Just send me an email. And I went back to sleep. The next morning, I've gone into the office and I go, you would not believe the dream I just had. <laughs> I had a dream that I'd gotten into the UFC. Can you believe that? Because back then, the mobile phones didn't have call logging, so I couldn't check what call. I didn't even think to check if I would had a call come in that night. I've jumped on to, onto my computer at work and... I get this email, hi, this is Joe from the UFC. Um, we're just confirming your participation in UFC 30. I'm like, oh, holy f***. I've got to call my coach. I've got, hey, coach, you won't believe what I did last night. <laughs> and I guess the rest is history. So we'll get into your uh, your title fight here in just a second. Um, what was your uh, training regimen like back then? Well, look, I mean, honestly, back then... Um, I was just a, a weekend warrior, I'll be honest. Like, I just, I worked all, all during the week. Um, I would go to a couple of classes in the evening, you know, jiu-jitsu classes. Um, sometimes my, my gym was under John Wilson. We had some shoot fighting classes as well. <coughs> I trained maybe three or four nights a week because uh, I really did enjoy it. But, but I was also a pro beach volleyball player as well. So, um any extra time I had training, I was actually going down to the beach, doing my beach volleyball training. On the weekends, I was competing beach volleyball. Um, so, yeah, it was kind of like it was just martial arts was something I did uh, as a social activity. And, you know, the fighting was more about challenging myself rather than ever having any sort of uh, career or future in it. It wasn't until, obviously, I got into the UFC, started to get a couple of fights that I kind of had to, to reevaluate um, which uh, direction I wanted my career path to go. Gotcha, gotcha. Now, for your your title fight, you want to tell us a little bit about the fight and the lead up to that? Sure. Um, so, um, as you're aware, I ended up fighting Jeremy Horn, um, and back then, again, no forums or anything like that. There was a paper called Full Contact Fighter, um, which we were always were like way behind in receiving here in Australia, but it was. Um, mailed out across the US. Uh, I think every month the Full Contact Fighter um, paper came out and it was really funny because when I went to uh, the UFC, there was a copy of it there and of course they were talking about um, our fight, mine and Tito's um, and every single pundit, uh, oh sorry, not uh, Tito, mine and Jeremy's, every pundit on it had said Elvis will lose in under three minutes by submission. <laughs> So my goal was to reverse it and win it in under three minutes by submission. I achieved that goal in two minutes and 59 seconds. So Here's the predestination. And <laughs> yep. And uh, obviously, um, that went really well. Like, I literally, because it was so, a short-notice fight, I trained a very specific game plan. The goal was to, to kick him from the outside, force him to come in. My boxing was terrible back then. Um, I could strike. I knew I could hit hard, but I was not a boxer. I had, because of my Taekwondo background, I had very good kicks. So the, the goal was always to force him to come into uh, boxing range, which allowed me to clinch. I would pull guard and I would go for um, my patented armbar triangle uh, combination attacks. And I ended up getting him with an, uh, a combination armbar triangle. I mean, he extends the body perfectly and really puts the pressure on Jeremy. Right there, he's got it sunk really deep, and he's still controlling the arm that he can go to the armbar with, and just a great job by Elvis. He surprised Jeremy Horn. Even though that wasn't what I was aiming for, it was one or the other, and putting the two together, um, I got this, uh, that submission. 
then after the fight, Joe's come up to me and gone, no, sorry. Um, after the fight, I've, you know, we've watched Tito destroy Evan Tanner and I've spoken with my coach and we're like, look, let's take a, a, a good educated approach to this. We're not going to fight for the title. We'll, you know, we'll get some build up matches. We'll get some experience. We'll build, build a specific game plan for Tito because obviously he's, um, you know, he's, he was a beast in the cage. Everyone was terrified of him. And I went, yeah, no, look, that's a, that's a great idea. Flew home as soon, you know, again, 4 a.m. in the morning. Hey, Joe, Elvis, this is Joe. Um, we've got no uh, fighters for Tito. You want to take the title fight? And I'm like, sure, no problems. Next morning, hey, coach, you wouldn't believe what I did last <laughs> night. So, you know, I ended up uh, taking that fight. And, uh, you know, I actually spent, because we, we got um, a whole UFC, uh, like there was actually a UFC in between. So it was almost... Um, about six weeks or something where I actually six to eight weeks where I actually got to, to, to do a camp and stuff. Um, so I actually started training specifically the first month I was actually working full time and training. <coughs> the second month I've contacted the UFC and said, look, I don't want to be rude, but the amount of money you're paying me really isn't enough for me to be able to quit my job to take a month off. Would you be willing to throw me some extra money? I'll take them the rest of this time off and I'm just going to train specifically for this fight. And then Joe said, look, I'll get back to you. Went to the UFC. UFC said, yep, we'll throw you a couple of thousand dollars on top of that. And I'm like, yep, you have, as long as you cover the wage I'm not getting, I'm happy to do it. Mm -hmm. So I then spent the month training specifically for Tito. And again, the, the strategy was to use a lot of striking on the outside, not let him come in obviously that's easier said than done if he clinches use a lot of knees try and either break free or pull guard um, and, and during the fight that's pretty much what happened I was using the kicks um, from the outside um, landed some really good ones and post at the time I didn't think they were bothering Tito but I found out afterwards he ended up getting an egg on his shin from one of the checks and when as soon as I did that to him he's like I don't want to be here anymore and so he <laughs> He obviously instigated the clinch. I just assumed it was part of his strategy, but apparently his strategy was to, to test my striking. Um, he ended up clinching with me. When I clinched with him, I'm going, this guy's a house. I either need to get out. Like, I couldn't move him. Like, he just, he was one of the strongest individuals I'd ever um, tied up with. And I'd fought against the 120 kilo guys, which, you know, 265 pound guys, and they didn't feel that strong. So I ended up pulling guard. Um, you know, working my attacks from the bottom. I had a couple of opportunities, didn't quite get them. Tito was able to neutralize. And obviously, if you've watched the fight, you'd know that um, ended up getting stopped because of a um, cut due to elbows. Yeah, it was a pretty nasty one. They had elbows going on back then. So that's the same thing he did yeah. to Evan Tanner, too, with the elbows, as I recall. So, uh, Well, he actually um, picked him up, gave him a slam that's right. KO in the head, but then elbowed him on top of that while he was unconscious. Yeah, he was already out. While Big John drove in. Which also reminds me, one of the best parts of the, the UFC back in the day is they were like Pride, that they had the massive entrances, I think, which for the title fights had those huge entrances. And I think myself and Tito probably had one of the best entrances ever. I know later on Chuck had his um, massive entrance as well with the, um, the tap out guys. But yeah, on our entrance, he had um, all the flames, you know, obviously Tito flames coming out. I had this giant throne and laser light show and um, great video montage into the lead of it. And like it was honestly one of the um, the highlights of, um, you know, that fight was a, the entrance. And it's awesome to be able to look back that, you know, I'm a part of that history where we had those entrances and... Um, even though, and the UFC later got rid of them, got rid of the ramp and uh, and all the all the cool stuff there. Now it's a, it's a lot more of a hardcore boxing style entrance where the the fighters literally just with their corner run out or uh, head straight out. So I've got to experience both, and you know there are advantages and disadvantages to both. But um, definitely, I one of the things that always uh, depressed me was 
I try to convince the UFC to fly my throne back to Australia, and they wouldn't do it for me. <laughs> oh, my gosh. You think, you know, I don't know if Dana was in charge yet back then, but you think he would have acquiesced a little bit, at least for, because you did them a solid by showing up on short notice, but, uh, yeah, what are you going to do? Look, I have to admit, Dana was really cool back in the day. Um, um, one of the first, um, like, obviously, I met him very briefly when I first turned up, and then, you know, well, I'm in the U.S., and... Um, uh, that that first, the very first UFC was in um, New Jersey. Trump, Trump, Marsh, uh, Taj Mahal, which is very convenient considering who your president mm-hmm. is right now. Um, so we're in the Trump Taj Mahal, and um, it was a casino. I'm not a casino person. I'm not a gambler. I didn't smoke or drink, so I spent a lot of time in the UFC office because I I knew Joe down there. I ended up meeting Josh Hedges, the photographer. I was interested in photography. I became a photographer later on, so. I used to just hang out the back and chat to the admin staff whenever they weren't working. And it was also an opportunity to meet a lot of the, the big name UFC fighters because they would be coming into the office. So I'm hanging there. And then um, I think on the, the second day I'm there, I'd met, you know, most of the office staff. I'd met, I obviously knew Joe from online, but I'd met him and I'd met um, Dana White uh, once. And I'm sitting in the office and everyone's vacated and this phone starts ringing. Then it hangs up, then it rings again and again. So I'm like, obviously, it's it's an important call. Somebody um, needs something. So I've I've leant over, I've picked up the phone and I've gone. And as I picked it up, Dana White's walked into the room. I go, good morning, UFC officers, UFC fighter Elvis speaking. Um, Zufa here, how can I help? And they're like, oh, hi, this is um, so-and-so. I'm looking for um, Joe Silver. I'm like, look, I'm really sorry. There's nobody else here in the office. Give me a moment. I'm going to grab a pen and paper. I'm going to take your details. I'm going to pass them on to him. I can't guarantee when he will contact you back, but I will guarantee you that he will get your details. So when I ever got a pen and paper, I'm like, yeah, okay, sorry, your name was. Took the details. Um, went, look, thank you very much. Uh, really appreciate uh, your understanding in this matter. Um, UFC rules. Have a great day. And I've hung up the phone. And then Dana's looked at me and goes, Elvis, what are you doing? What, why are you answering the phone? I said, look, Dana, nobody's here. I'm part of the team. I'll do whatever I have to to, uh, to help this uh, to help you guys succeed. We're here to become number one. And he goes, I'm never going to forget that, Elvis. And I went, thanks, Dana. So... Um, yeah, ever since then, he's pretty much always remembered me, so I guess it wasn't a bad thing. Well, they say there's no small parts, only small actors, right? So <laughs> it's a great way to – opportunity, man. When opportunity knocks. You just got to answer that door sometimes. It's it's a, not always a big thing, yeah. you know. Sometimes it's a little thing that gets you noticed. So I know you're best known as a fighter. Uh, we're just going to talk a little bit more about that, and we'll move on to more personal stuff because there's a lot more to you than just fighting. So uh, during your era, who do you think was the most complete fighter out there? Who do you think epitomized MMA the most in your in the time you were frame, you were fighting? Well, back in my time frame, I always um, felt that Frank Shamrock was the future um, of MMA, and he's pretty much the the role model of what we are doing today. Um, I think because he was the most well-rounded fighter he had. If you couldn't strike, he could strike with you. If you couldn't wrestle, he could wrestle with you. If you couldn't grapple, he could outgrapple you. So he had um, a high skill level in all the areas, but he was a specialist um, in none of them. Um, I think that's probably changed a little bit more, and um, later on it, it probably became someone like, um, um, you know, Marco Huas or, you know, even Ken Shamrock or... Um, Nowadays, I think what you need to succeed is you do need to be a specialist in one area, but you need to be well-versed enough in every other area to not lose to your opponent in that area and then force them into your area of strength. You know, guys like, um, I was going to say John Jones, but I think he's even now evolving into someone closer to to Frank Shamrock, Um, probably someone like Khabib who can strike with you if he has to, as the wrestling to put you down and his grappling will outclass you. So he's a specialist in that grappling ground and pound area, but his skill level is high enough everywhere else that he can 
um, survive where you're strongest and take you to where uh, he can always beat you. Um, and obviously, there are other guys uh, in the division very similar to that. Uh, Whitaker's the same. Uh, Whitaker is obviously in the striking realm. His his strength is he will outstrike you. He will beat you up standing. But if he if you take him down, he has the grappling to survive, the ability to get back to his feet, um, and the, the ability to scramble and get off the cage to put you again back into um, his realm. So I think Frank Shamrock was uh, kind of the 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 role model to to what uh, we are seeing today. But I think it's kind of evolved at that a little bit, uh, that step further where you do need that well-roundedness, but still that specialty to take people outside of their comfort zone. Yeah, because when everyone's all well-rounded, just being well-rounded is not going to be great. You have to have at least one that you can slide into and be better at the other person at, right? Yeah, Stipe with his striking, DC with his wrestling. Um, so, yeah, you know, the, the, you have to be good everywhere, but you have to be great somewhere as well. So I've noticed a lot of – well, let's we'll say this. Uh, was it difficult for you to kind of to retire from the fight game, um, get out of, of professional fighting? Uh, I know a lot of fighters seem to have a hard time letting go, either because of financial reasons or competitive drive. Was this something that was difficult for you to kind of let go and step back a little more of the background role? Well, I mean, uh, it was injury that actually make it a little easier for me. Um, but saying that, um, even the whole time I was fighting, I was already setting up a career. I mean, you can see uh, my gym behind me. I was already building that um, with a plan for the future. Um, I was working in IT anyway, so I had a fallback plan as well. Um, thankfully, being well-spoken that, you know, once I got into uh, the UFC, I kind of realized very early um, that commentating um, or discussing and breaking down fights was something that I would be able to do. Um, I actually commentated UFC um, was it 32, it was UFC 32, um, which had um, uh, Buster Munch and Chuck Liddell fighting, may have been 33, I'm a bit rusty on that. Um, so no, I, I think it was never going to be a concern. Part of what helped um, was that mindset. I think when you mentally retire, it becomes very difficult to let go. I didn't. I never retired. If the UFC calls me now, I'll take up uh, uh, the fight. If um, you know the right offer is there, I'm ready to jump into the cage. I just haven't had the right offer, so that makes it easy to retire. I don't feel like I need to go out there searching um, for offers that that aren't going to be suitable just because I need to fight because I haven't retired. Um, I got injured um, quite. In, in my camp for UFC 110, I, I had to miss out on um, that fight. My shoulder got blown out, ended up having surgery. I was off um, for a year without training. And then, so it would have been two years before I'd even be able to fight again. So by the time I got back into um, fight shape, probably already um, you know in that um, Joel Romero age bracket, um, sadly, not in the Joel Romero physical conditioning, <laughs> but what can you do? Um, I uh, contacted the UFC and they said, look, you need to go out there and get a few more fights. I kind of considered it and I'm like, eh, I don't want to fight for peanuts. So I'll leave the door open for the UFC. If you need someone, I'm here to jump in on short notice. If not, I'm not retired, but I'm not actually going to be looking for any fights either. Um, and I think having... Um, ability to you know have my business um, going into the Fox Sports commentary just made it a lot easier not to think about um, fighting so much I still compete uh, in jiu-jitsu um, competed last year um, uh, at the Nogi uh, Worlds got double bronze in my weight in the open my goal is to go back to the, the Nogi Worlds this year um, see if I can get that gold medal couple of years back I competed and the world masters got silver so I just want to kind of not ready to let go of competition um, but I'm happy not to get punched into the fa punched in the face unless I'm getting paid a bucket load of money you know you know if I get that uh, hundred thousand dollar offer from the UFC we need a short notice fight what the hell you can punch me in the face 
I haven't fixed it anyway, so I'm not too stressed about it. <laughs> you sound like you're gunning for uh, Carlos Newton's uh, uh, nickname. You sound like you're the Ronin now, <laughs> kind of just traveling out, <laughs> waiting for the fights to come, you know. But um, all right, so yeah, a lot of uh, athletes, when they kind of you know stop doing what they're famous for, they seem, seem to run across some hard times or whatever. You seem to have parlayed uh, your skills and experience into you know quite the little uh, growing empire. So do you want to tell us about some of your current ventures and uh, you know what you're basically doing for a living nowadays? Yeah. So as I mentioned, I was doing IT. Ended up quitting that to uh, to run a full time academy. So. Um, I opened up Academy with uh, my business partner, which was uh, Citizen Perosh Martial Arts. Uh, we ran for 14 years, very successful. Um, he hit the end of his fight career. We decided we had different visions, so we decided to go our separate way. He opened up his team. I ended up opening King's Academy. I opened up the first um, basically full-time super MMA center, um, everything all in one place uh, here in Australia. Um, we have the you know the largest mat space um, with over 340 square meters of mat space. I'd have to convert that. I think that's like 34,000 or 3,400 feet or something like that mat space. Not very good with uh, my uh, meters to feet conversion. <laughs> yeah, it's about it's uh, about three three feet to meter. So okay, it's a, it's a big mat space. Um, uh, we have a cage, a ring, we have a strength and conditioning room, we have a sauna, we have ice baths, we have a hyperbaric oxygen chamber, we have a hot yoga room. So obviously during my fight career and um, post-injury with my shoulder and everything, I, just, I, I realized the importance not only of high-level training, but high-level recovery. If you want to be successful, you need to train like the best, but you need to recover like the best. So that's why my facility doesn't just encompass the training, but the recovery that goes with it. You know, um, I, I promote um, healthy eating, whole foods. Um, I, I do the I do keto. I think that's um, getting rid of processed carbohydrates and excess sugars. I think makes a massive difference. Um, you know, we keep a good range of supplements here. Um, I provide sugar-free drinks. So the center here is is, is all about um, achieving your maximal performance. Um, also, through that, um, I connected with uh, the UFC Gyms Australia when they were first launching their program. They were looking for someone to oversee um, their jiu-jitsu program. Naturally, being Australia's first uh, MMA fighter, first UFC fighter, um, they were very keen to get me on board. So I jumped on board from day one, became the head of the UFC Gyms Australia Jiu-Jitsu program, so I oversee that. Um, my goal is to open my own UFC gym here in Australia. It's just been a matter of trying to find the right location um, that allows me to, you know, to promote um, both the UFC and a healthy uh, living lifestyle in conjunction with King's Academy, which I'm, I'm doing here. Through that, I managed to pick up a connection uh, at Fox Sports, um, back when Fox Sports was very big with uh, the UFC, got on, spent several years working on UFC fight week, breaking down uh, numerous fights, which um, I really enjoyed. I, I love watching footage. Um, it had a double-sided effect. Not only did it allow me to discuss and talk about the sport that I absolutely love and get paid for it, it gave me further into insight into what's going on but that insight was then able to be transferred to my students here um, at the academy because I wasn't just breaking down fights for them I was breaking down fights for everyone so it gave me a really good insight in what we needed to be doing what they needed to do uh, to improve and it meant I didn't become pigeonholed into one style of fighter a lot of gyms become known for one, one style of fighter um, unless you have multiple coaches responsible, um, whereas my insight into the all different facets allowed me to go to my fighter strengths and build on that rather than trying to build off just my strengths. Um, I obviously brought in extra coaches and specialists in the area in boxing and wrestling uh, and recovery um, so to ensure that um, our guys always get the best. So, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a lot going on. Uh, the UFC 
fight week stuff has fallen back a little since ESPN got on board. Um, part of the disappointing thing is they're not really interested uh, in local content, so they're not doing anything here in Australia. Um, Fox Sports still does a few bits and pieces to promote pay-per-views, particularly when they're uh, Aussies on board. So I do jump on and do um, like what we call MMA 101 breakdowns. I break down uh, the main events and um, let the, the fans know kind of something that the, the, the fighters may be doing that they can look out for during the fight and for the uneducated, the less educated fan, um, it's a great opportunity for them to look for something in the show so they become a little bit more vested in, uh, in what's going on. So um, a lot of fingers in different pies. Um, obviously, I'm also in the recovery realm. Uh, I'm working with um, a CBD company, Irva Biosciences in the US, by looking at a way that we can um, legally bring that over here, bring CBD for our uh, students. Um, I work with EMR, uh, electromagnetic, uh, electromagnetic radiation, which is a red light therapy, again, part of um, the recovery, um, looking at how I can bring them over here to Australia. Obviously, they, they are legal. I just, um, that's a fairly new venture, something I want to uh, start to expand on because uh, red light therapy along with uh, oxygen therapy are two, um, two very little known but highly researched um, methodologies that aren't being used to... Um, capacity and I think it's something that we could um, really start to expand inside uh, our training centers. Yeah, I know you mentioned recovery. See, I'm a big, big fan of strongman and powerlifting as well. And uh, it's amazing how much time that these athletes spend actually on recovery. It's like almost more than training, you know, uh, between the ice hot, ice cold baths and the hot baths and the uh, oxygen chambers and, and everything else they do is just, it's so incredibly important. I mean, it, it's amazing how much the science of, of health and fitness has dialed in, you know, <laughs> since the earlier days of training. Oh, absolutely. It's, there's, um, well, recovery is the MMA of the health world. Let's be honest. It's like in MMA, you need to strike, grapple, wrestle. Um, ground and pound, you need to be able to mix your different modalities. And it's the same with recovery. There's not any one modality that is going to give you all the answers. You need massage, you need red light, you need uh, heat therapy, you need cold therapy, you need oxygen therapy, you need diet, you need nutrition, you need stretching, um, you need uh, percussion. Like, it just keeps going. There's a lot to it, and it's, um, it's impossible to do everything. So what you have to do is go out, and tailor what's available to you, what times do you have, and then choose the modalities that are going to give you the greatest results. Now, uh, I know you mentioned it earlier um, about photography, and I've seen some of your camera gear. It's pretty impressive. So is, is photography something of a hobby for you, or is it more something lucrative, something you go out and actually want to do professionally? I'm going to – this is a disclaimer now. <laughs> I am what you would call an obsessive-compulsive. When I don't, when I do something, I don't do it in halves. I took up MMA. I now run a, an, an MMA um, academy, and um, you know, when I started working IT, I ended up working for Microsoft. I don't do things in halves. Uh, same with photography. Photography started um, just as a hobby. I just bought a camera and a lens, wanted to take pictures. I ended up um, starting my own photography business. I ended up shooting weddings, christenings, birthdays. Um, but due to the workload um, and the workload I had running my business, sadly, I wasn't able to um, keep that up. But I was able to keep up the collection of photography equipment. So I actually have a room full of uh, photography equipment with multiple camera bodies and lenses and stuff. And because I don't actually get to um, run my photography business, I use it for my martial arts center. So... I take photos here at the gym, which I use obviously for my social media and uh, letting people know what's going on. The flip side is a lot of the photos I take when I post online, the parents or students um, have high quality photos that they can post on their social media so they can be proud of what they're doing. They take those photos and they can share them with their friends and families. I do the same thing when we go to tournaments. I try and take photos. Uh, with jiu-jitsu tournaments, easy because I'm just ringside. I can take photos while coaching. It's um, fa a fairly easy task for me. Um, with the MMA, obviously, I will take photos backstage, not out um, cage side because um, with with um, 
guys getting hit in the head. It's you've got to really focus on uh, yeah. what you're doing there and then. So I don't do the the cage side photography, or if it's a boxing show, I, I'll only do the the boxing uh, ringside photography if I if my boxing coach is is the head coach and he's doing uh, the primary work and I'm there just there to to assist in the corner. Um, if I'm the head coach any in any of them, obviously I'm not doing uh, the photography. So. Uh, it's a hobby that became a profession, which is a passion, which is now kind of interlinked with everything else I do. So, um, I mean, I think if you look carefully, you can see behind along the um, wall across there, all the photos of my students. So I put up uh, photos of all our students from competitions, uh, training, so, you know, the, the students can walk in here and go, hey, that's me up on the wall. They can, because, you know, I'm proud of um, what they're doing and what they're achieving. And I want them to be proud of it. I want them to be able to look up and, and see themselves up on the wall. And, you know, for the new people, they, you know, their goal might be to try and get up on that wall. I mean, it's a, it's a laudable goal, too. We, we got a saying here in the States, uh, a man of many hats. So it sounds like you are uh, definitely almost like a, a fight renaissance man. You got so many different things going on. It's it's great to be able to juggle it all, isn't it? But um, Well, it's, it's funny you mentioned that because I was actually just chatting to someone the other day. Um, when I first got into uh, the business of martial arts, um, a book I read was called The E-Myth. And it was that, that was pretty much um, the philosophy behind it. It says you can't wear one hat. Just because you're an amazing coach doesn't mean you're going to have an amazing business. Just because you're an amazing competitor doesn't mean you're going to be an amazing um, coach. So what you have to do is you have to go out there and teach yourself to be amazing in each of the different disciplines. You have to take one hat off and put another hat on and then make sure that when you're wearing that hat, that is your focus. So um, funny you say that because I, I really do, um, when I am doing one particular, when I'm working on my business, I am a businessman. When I am on the mat, I am a coach. When I am taking photos, I'm a photographer. When I'm cleaning the gym, I'm a cleaner. Uh, you know, whatever I, I am doing at the time, that is what my um, primary focus is. I would say that's probably a uh, a uh, pretty regular occurrence for someone who's successful. I think anyone who is successful in basically any endeavor has to be just like that. You know, you you get, you got to be able to focus and dial in on the on the task at hand, so you don't miss the little things. You know. Um, yeah. Look, and again, being a business owner, if my staff are off sick and I can't find a replacement, if I can't do the work, how can I expect them to do the work? So everything they do, you know, I, I make sure I'm able to. I can jump in and sit down and do it. Sometimes it does take me a little while to remember how to do it. It's been a few years. Um, yeah, look, there's nothing that my staff do that I won't do. So, okay, so you got a day when you are not going to the gym, you're not going to work, you're not thinking about work. It's a day of recreation. What does a day of recreation entail for uh, Elvis Hinesek? Well, if it doesn't involve sleeping, <laughs> um, look, again, recovery is a big part of it. I have my own sauna at my house. I have an ice bath. So I, I like to, on the weekends, I, my priority is to at least um, try and get two sessions a week of ice bath and uh, sauna time. Um, I have my pets. I have dogs, cats, birds, lizards. So I find that very relaxing looking after them. Um, even during the week um, helps me take my mind off any anything because, well, again, while I'm looking after my pets, my sole concern is looking after my pets. So I forget about what's going on at work, I give them attention, I play with them, I'll feed them, um, give them medication, do whatever I've got to do. And then when that's done, I go back to what I was doing before. So, you know, that's a big part of it. Um, I do have a problem. I'm not very good at sitting still. So I don't like to sit around and do nothing. Um, I live near the river. Um, so one of the things when I do have spare time, I love to drag out my kayak and I get out and paddle because it's a way for me to get away from everything but not stop doing anything. So I get to kind of stay active, but at any point I can just stop and float. And then once that itch gets into me that I can't handle not doing anything, I just start paddling again. <laughs> so, yeah, kayaking is one of the things I enjoy doing. Um, also, my garden, 
uh, looking after my garden out the back. Um, you know, I, I'm sure a, a lot of uh, people have house pride. I definitely have a house pride, so having a nice garden and um, not so much picking up uh, the lawn mines, uh, dog poop, but it's got to be done as well. So uh, sometimes uh, on my time off, it's not always the fun stuff. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes you've got to deal with the shit, quite literally. <laughs> Yeah, you know, you're human just like everybody else. So, <laughs> um, see, so yeah, I know you're a busy guy, so I don't have too much more for you. Just a couple more questions. We'll let you get back to your schedule. So, um, oh, I better say, and spending time with my partner. I mean, she'll kill me if she ever listens to this. And I don't mention that I enjoy spending time with her. So, obviously, that's very important as well. I'll put a timestamp in the video. So, just tell her to go right to that timestamp. And so, she wants to see the other stuff and seeing it took 58 minutes to mention her. <clears throat> But um, uh, <laughs> good, good recovery. Recovery comes in all forms, doesn't it? Not just in physical. So, um, um, so what advice would you give somebody who wants to get into the fight game? Brand new guy gets in his head, hey, I want to go be like that guy on TV. What advice would you give that person? I mean, one, make sure it is what you want to do. Um, it's, I mean, fighting... Very few people make a lot of money fighting, and I say very few. Um, yes, you may make $30,000 a year, but remember, you're getting punched in the head. Ensure it's what you want to do, and then if you want to do it, commit to it. it, it you're not going to be successful without sacrifice, and that is regardless of what career you want to do. You need desire, de determination, and dedication. If you can provide those, you can succeed. But it does not come without sacrifice. When I was fighting, I put my social life aside. I had to put, you know, junk food aside. Um, if there is something that you think is going to hold you back, you've got to decide what's more important. It's the same with health. People go, don't you miss cakes and lollies and ice cream? And I go, no, feeling good feels better than a sweet taste for that moment, you know? So, and that's the way you've got to look at fighting. Does victory mean more to you than going out on the weekend and partying with your friends? If it does, remember, you're going to have to give up more time for that one moment of success. So the sacrifice is always greater than what you're going to achieve. If you can live with that, if you can um, accept the sacrifice, you have the desire to do it, the dedication to get in there and do it every day, then go ahead. If you have any doubt, jump in, do it for fun. Don't make a commitment to anything. Maybe start with jiu-jitsu or Muay Thai or boxing or rest. Pick one, put some time in, start competing, see how you feel, and then build from there. So that's that's more if you're, if you're not sure because... I still think martial arts are an absolute value um, for life. I've had this discussion with some parents recently, um, and I've had a parent, a couple of parents who weren't so sure, had some instances happen at school, some things happen, and then they've realized the absolute value of having martial arts and self-defense there for their kids. Um, if it weren't for the martial arts, the ability to, to dedicate and commit to something, I wouldn't be as successful in the business as I am it's because I've taken what I've done in my training and fighting and applied it to my business. That mindset, that um, single-minded um, dedication to succeed. Yeah, I know. Just, I mean, learning a martial art, and I, I learned it quite a bit when I was younger too, it's just it's such a great confidence booster, for, especially for people who maybe are not too confident in themselves. And it's not getting the feeling, I'm going to go in there and just beat anyone's ass who I see at any given time, but it's like, you start carrying yourself very differently. I walk into a room and I look around and it's like, okay, I feel pretty safe in here. And, and knowing that at least if something weird happens, I might at least have a chance at this point. I'm not going to be a vulnerable puppy or whatever, but I don't know. I just... Well, look, honestly, like sometimes the, the greatest victories are even smaller than that. Like I have kids who come in who won't even talk to other kids because they're shy, they're afraid. And just within a, within a month of coming here and training, they're coming up to the other kids. They want to meet and talk. New kids come in. They go up to them and introduce themselves. And that's a success because they've come out of their shell. They have more confidence in who they are. And then they're passing that confidence on to, to other kids, you know. I've had 
kids that would literally come in and sit in a corner and are now world cha- junior world champions. You know, um, I've had kids that um, with, with social disorders and they're now coming up and talking, uh, they're improving. Um, is, this, is every child going to be a world champion? No. But can they? Yes. Um, it just, again, it, it'll come down to a lot to that desire to get dedication and also on behalf of the parents, you know, for a child to be a world champion, you've got to make a lot of sacrifices as well. I mean, parents already make massive sacrifices for their kids. So um, a lot of times they're already prepared to make those further sacrifices. Sometimes it's not possible. So, um, but seeing the improvement of your child becoming happy, more confident, more outgoing, that alone helps in all aspects of their lives. Well, that's great words there, and uh, like I said, I, I highly encourage any uh, parent out there who is even thinking about something to do for their kids, you know, just to at least let them try it. You know, I think it's it's great uh, competing against another person, and just there's no other feeling like it. <laughs> and it, it's just something you can't tell it; they have to experience for themselves. But uh, end of sermon there. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and get ready to let you go, uh, Elvis. Is there any uh, projects or ventures that you want to go ahead and plug before uh, we get on out of here? Well, I think, I think I've mentioned most of them. Obviously, if you're in the Sydney area, head down to, to King's Academy, um, jump on, come and train. You know, our doors are open. We have open mats every Sunday, which are open to all clubs, all affiliations. We have, um, you just come along, you pay your $10 mat fee. If you just want some cross training. Uh, if you're in the Moorbank Liverpool area, then hey, we're the number one uh, academy in Sydney. So, yeah. You're doing yourself a disservice if you're not coming and training here. Uh, kingsacademy.com.au is our website. Uh, as mentioned, uh, if you're in the US looking for a great CBD product, we have a biosciences who I'm partnering with uh, to bring to try and bring CBD out here to Australia. Um, if you're looking for red light therapy, the EMR units, um, electromagnetic revolution, absolutely fantastic. If you use the code KING at checkout, you'll get 10% off. Um, they have the highest irradiance, um, and the benefit is that is like I have mine hung up above my bed, so I can just lie down to get my red light therapy rather than standing in front of a unit or holding a unit uh, up for 10 or 15 minutes. So if you are interested in red light, look them up. Um, if you can't make it out to my gym, but you are in Sydney or around Australia, there's a UFC gym nearby. Hop into them. Uh, they're great centers. They're there to to help people. Uh, improve their lives. It's not just about martial arts uh, with the UFC gyms. They're uh, providing health benefits for kids, for adults, and you don't have to be a fighter. Everyone thinks you have to be a fighter to train at UFC gym. You don't. We are all fighters inside, and and they're there to help you uh, fight your own personal battles. So, you know, go along. And again, um, for anyone out there, if you are having problems, I know we all, a lot of people go through depression. I've, I've had recent uh, friends and training partners pass away from that. You know, don't be afraid to reach out. You know, there are a lot of people that want to help. My doors, my email, my Facebook, uh, my messenger, my Instagram is always open. If anybody wants to chat, uh, my Twitter, send me a message. I'm always there to, to uh, lend a, an ear. And uh, even though I may not always have the, the answer, I, I will um, listen to you and um, offer any support that I can. So uh, keep that in mind as well. So hopefully, um, if you're not already training martial arts, you will get out there and start training. Um, if you've got kids, get them into the, the gym. It, it is only going to benefit them in the long run. Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity to have my say. And uh, I've had a lot to say, so hopefully I haven't gone uh, overboard. And... Um, if we ever need to do a follow-up, let me know. Roger that. Uh, hopefully one day I can get over to Sydney and actually uh, traipse around Kings Academy for, uh, firsthand. <laughs> Maybe even get a map picture or something one day. But, uh, yeah, that'd be, that'd be great. But I really appreciate you uh, spending time with us today. Oh, 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 I get a picture on the wall, too? I'm one of the OGs. Maybe. Maybe. Oh, yeah, well, uh, you have never seen me roll, so I don't know if I get a picture. Maybe <laughs> it might be like a stencil <laughs> or something somewhere, <laughs> but there won't be no picture. I've been on a mat like 
Sometimes eight years. The best fighters. But uh, yeah, anyway, thanks again, Elvis, so much for uh, being with us today and uh, spending so much time and telling so many great stories. And uh, you know, maybe uh, we'll have you on again in the future. And um, you know, best of luck in all your endeavors. Best of luck to all your stable of fighters. And uh, you know, be happy, be healthy. And um, do you have anything further you want to say before we get on out of here? No, look I, again. Thank you very much. Um, look forward to hopefully maybe we can get my fighters on to have a bit of a chat about their training and what they're doing. And as I always like to finish with, it's good to be the king. <laughs> Words to live by. So anyway, thanks for watching. Uh, my next interview actually might be another uh, fellow Aussie, uh, crocodile biologist Adam Britton. Uh, but more on that later. I'm still working out schedules with him. Uh, he's actually out in the bush right now. So um, anyway, I appreciate you watching. Uh, there'll be some uh, links down below to uh, King's Academy and uh, the Facebook page and all that. So you can go out and check out Elvis's great stuff for yourself. And be sure to check out some of his old fights, man. You might be surprised. So uh, thanks again for watching. Until next time, this is Genome and Elvis out.